Sometimes when I'm sitting, or even when I'm just doing the dishes and these negative thoughts that I have, that I say to myself, they come up. And then sometimes I'm okay with that, I can ignore them. And then sometimes I think, will you always be there? Will this always? I'm okay that you come, but will you always be there? Yeah. Mm. I mean, of course, that voice which says, will you always be there, could also be seen as part of the whole inner critic. But I think it's a valid question, and I wonder if sometimes those voices will persist to a degree until we sort of investigate them a little bit more closely. Because maybe there's a message in that voice that's trying to protect you, perhaps, trying to help you in some sort of perverted way. You know, <laughs> trying to uh, get you to improve or hurry up or whatever it is with the dishes um, <laughs> or otherwise. Um, and sometimes there's a message there that needs to be heard. Maybe it's just that the inner critic is not putting it in a very skillful way, in a way that's actually um, quite undermining, and there could be a better way, a more encouraging way to reframe it. But that could be the case. Um, sometimes it might just be that there is pain, you know, there's inner pain, um, vulnerability, whatever it is. Maybe you're not in the best of moods and that's why it can take hold at that particular time. You know, maybe you're already weary and thinking, oh my God, I can't handle this for another minute. And that needs to be met, you know. And so sometimes it's about getting in contact with the emotion underneath the thought rather than dealing with the thought which is in a way a product of something else. You know, maybe there's not enough kindness in your heart. Maybe there's, yeah. Or there's some hurt there that needs to be met. So I think it can be really helpful at that time to pick up compassion and just say, oh, I hear this. This is painful. This is difficult. You know, I hear that you're really tired. What does this need right now? You know, maybe you need to stop the dishes and go and have a rest or have a hot chocolate or... <laughs> or something like that or just to say I care about you you know I care sometimes that's what's needed rather than just running in the thought when you say that it might be something you need to investigate yeah I'm still very new in my practice and I'm not quite sure what investigation mm. is yeah I mean, I don't, I guess my main practice has mostly been investigating at the level of physical sensations when these kind of things arise because I trust that more to be a closer approximation of what's really happening than the thought. That feels to me like an overlay on what's happening. So I guess for me, part of investigating the thought is getting in touch with the emotional resonance of that thought, and I can do that most tangibly through the physical bodily sensations, so I might just get in contact with like how I feel. Often for me it's manifest around here, like a sort of some tension or anxiety, something like that. Um, and investigating it just means like noticing it and I guess seeing that it's changing. Like, okay, this is a sensation, what's its nature? I mean, sometimes it can also be just seeing the sensation and learning how to meet it with kindness and how to relax it. That's also very valid, like we did in the meditation. Other times, just seeing, okay, this is the nature of the sensation. Um, it's changing. It's not mine. It's not going to last forever. And if you stay with that, you'll see that it does change and it does start to fade. And along with it, probably the thinking it will too. But other times, it can be helpful to investigate the thought itself. And one of the best methods I've found for that is using this method by Byron Katie. Have you heard of her? This helped me once when I was having a very hard time after some abuse, actually. And, um, oh my goodness, I was having such strong thoughts of, like, I can't cope with this, like, you know, the world's not safe, and basically I meant nothing to that person, and really heavy thoughts, you know, that were quite derailing. And I worked with this book, and it was very, very simple. There was just four questions, and one was, um, so you write down the thought that's bothering you, so in this case, like, she doesn't love me, or something, right? Or like, I betrayed my instincts, or something like this. And then you asked, um, is it true? 
right? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> and then, it, can you be sure that it's true? And then it's like, uh, are you absolutely sure that it's I mean, you could ask it more than once, you know, are you absolutely sure that it's true? And then it's like, uh, almost. So there's a chip, there's a, a way in. And then I think the next question is, how would you be without that thought? What would it be like without that thought? And when you think that, oh, without that thought, I'd actually feel much better, I'd feel relieved, you know, I wouldn't feel so depressed, and you get a sense of how that would actually feel. So you're making it a reality that there is a way not to have that thought. And then I think the last one is um, turn the thought around. So instead of saying, I betrayed myself, it could be, um, I betrayed my friend, or I didn't betray myself, or... "Mm." I can't think of a good example now, but you turn it around somehow just for the sake of seeing that the other could be equally as true or untrue. And actually, it sounds quite simple and a little superficial, perhaps, but for me, at that moment of crisis, it actually worked. So that was one way of investigating. Um, But the other way of investigating that I was speaking about earlier was noticing where that thought's coming from. Like, what is this motivated by? It's the the intentions behind the thought. So the three wholesome intentions are like the loving kindness, the compassion, and the letting go, like non-owning, right? So are you owning it? Are you clinging to it? Is it? Are you making it about you? Or making it mean something about you, you know? And the other three the, are the opposite. So is it a harmful thought, which is not compassionate? Is it a thought based on aversion and not loving kindness? Am I making it like all about me? And so when you see where it's coming from, sometimes that's enough to realize that's not a skillful way to go. Especially with practice, the mind starts to feel repelled by that. And also, especially when you develop in self-compassion. Like when you have a lot of self-compassion, you're not willing to compromise your well-being so readily. Does that make sense? And that's quite a lot, but... <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think you know they're just ideas for investigation. I think everybody finds their own ways, so you can experiment. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, in the text, it actually says in one place, for monastics, I guess, but this could apply to anyone, that if you find um, that the wholesome qualities are not increasing, and that, you know, basically that it's probably you developing a lot of unwholesome ones, then don't stay even for a day in that place. <laughs> and when I was struggling in a particular, at a particular time in my monastic life, if I would have followed that, I wouldn't have stayed you know, very long. And I'm so glad I didn't do that. And so I talked to my teacher and he just said, no, you know, you've got to see it over time because sometimes you can't depend on your mood at a given time. And you have to see if it is changing or if it's just like... I guess it's like your mood can be changing like this and it can be going like this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or it can be going like this gradually. You know, Yes, there's ups and downs, but is it generally moving in a positive way like are you developing some qualities that because you can't develop every quality in every situation 
So for me at the moment in my residence in Oxford, I don't feel I'm developing in meditation particularly because I'm not having as much time as usual. But I can see I'm developing in confidence, I'm developing in some different ways. Confidence is one of them. Um, I guess uh, persistence, <coughs> resilience, letting go to a certain extent to what the situation requires of me. Um, I'm developing in like connecting with inspiration, connecting with like the joys of living a virtuous life and that sort of thing. So in a way there is a deeper happiness, but it's not maybe in every way. But then I go back to Perth from my Rains retreat and when I'm on my retreat, if I didn't if I felt my meditation wouldn't take off in those three months, then I would probably reconsider. But at the moment it is still able to gain momentum during that time and so I feel like, yeah, this is good enough. I think no situation can be perfect. But good enough is probably good enough. Um, and sometimes challenges can be helpful in the long run. So I think with this kind of thing, it really is about, like, is this helping me on my spiritual path rather than just is it feeling good, you know? Rather than living a life that's more like subscribing to, like, pleasant feelings or, like, informed by how happy we are in the sensual world, maybe it can be something a bit deeper, like, is this life giving me meaning? Is it giving me some sense of um, purpose and, and potential to grow spiritually? At least that's how I would, what I would consider important. Yeah. I don't know. Just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, although with my teacher it doesn't work because he won't say. <laughs> But he just says, carry on. Very good, carry on. And so, that's probably good enough. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he did give me a little thing the other day, which was like, I pushed him. I was like, I had this dream, and you were telling me, like, I shouldn't write long emails, and it was really, like, he told me in not a very nice way in the dream. And I said, is there something in that, you know? And he said, well, let me put it this way. You could be a little bit more concise. <laughs> and then after that, I was like, mm, I need to express myself. <laughs> but actually, yeah, that was helpful because I don't think he was just talking about my emails to him. I mean, I write quite long emails to my friends as well, and sometimes I could be more concise because I don't have that much energy. you know. So he was basically saying it will free you up a bit more time. I was complaining I don't have enough time to meditate but I would only ask people I really trust to be honest because I think people are too eager to give negative feedback often I would ask people that really know me and that I can really trust Yes, we were going to get onto that. Yes, <laughs> which is the last resort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Curious to hear. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, so in those five, the substitution or replacement, uh, seeing the danger, ignoring. The next one is like um, it's a really hard to translate one, but it means something like um, um, stilling the thought formation, which I think means sort of seeing where it's coming from and sort of stopping it even before it becomes fully fledged. I mean, the simile that he gives is um, if you're walking quickly, start walking slowly. If you're walking slowly, sit down. So it's kind of also like giving space, I think. Like, okay, there's this thought formation, but can I really slow down? Maybe listen carefully, listen to the gaps between the words, something like that, and get more and more to like where it's coming from how it arises and then if that doesn't work that's the fourth one it says um, something really violent like with teeth clenched and tongue pressed against the upper part of the mouth crushing mind with mind something like that and my understanding with that is that that's only a last resort say if you're about to do something act on that thought in a really negative way so you want to really give that person a piece of your mind or even maybe hit somebody or 
something really, really, you know, that's going to cause a lot of problems later. Um, so if, you know, that thought is so compelling that there's no other way to stop it, you just have to, like, say, no, I'm not going to do that. So it's kind of speaking back, I mean, in the context of the inner critic, it could be speaking back to that inner critic in a firm way. You know, saying, no, I know where you're going and I'm not listening to this. This is, this is the inner critic, you know. Um, there's no truth in this and, and I'm not going to take that, you know. And, and then actually saying something back to it, like, actually, I'm very hardworking. People respect me. You know, I'm able to care for people. There's a lot of people who care for me, you know, that kind of thing when, when, when um, the voice is saying that you're hopeless and never be loved. Yeah, maybe something like that, I don't know. But I think it's not something you can do very often because it's a bit forceful. It's coming more from willpower than wisdom power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that helpful? Um, I think my understanding of the inner critic is something that's actually so demeaning and sort of undermining that it cripples us a bit in terms of being able to work for our own or anyone else's benefit. So I'm not sure that that would necessarily prevent, you know, the sort of, what would you call it? I mean, you called it anguish or like the sort of passion and the struggle that some of these great artists might have, musicians too. Um, I would imagine that when they're in the flow of the art, that voice is absent. And I would think that it may be coming more of a place of being connected to the emotion, like connected to the despair, connected to the anguish, and expressing it in a non-verbal way. Like art and music are both non-verbal. And I don't know, I mean, I have some experience of art. When I was younger, I was quite a good artist and used to spend hours drawing portraits and it would be very stilling for the mind. I mean, it was also fueled, you could say, by a teenage angst. I mean, there was a lot of passion in me and a lot of quest for meaning, but I would, in a way, channel that into the art, and I would be still, and I would be very focused, and I'd really put that into my work. And I think in meditation, too, you can put a lot of passion, in a way, into the way you're aware. Like, you can put a lot of um, energy and love and devotion into the practice even without the inner critic. I don't, know. I don't know that if you're on your back all the time with the inner critic, it would be very constructive. I'm sure they go through periods like that as well, but I would imagine it's when those periods end and they're able to like unleash something, maybe get more in contact with their emotion, that that's when these things are produced, I would think. But a lot of the paintings, too, are quite anguished, right? So as the mind quietens, you probably do start to draw more peaceful sort of things. <laughs> Depends what art you like, I suppose. <laughs> I used to like all the rock music, so. but now... I've no idea what I'd like now, because I, I stopped listening to that when I went to India, then I started to meditate, so I don't really know. Now when I hear that, I still think it's brilliant, but it's not my thing as such. It rouses quite strong emotions if I hear it it's like whoa you know <laughs> so I'm sure that now my taste would be for something much different yeah and eventually total silence <laughs> I 
I think that's the other side of the inner critic is like one of the other ways to start overcoming it is to appreciate when it's not there. That's why I was saying focusing on that all the time is maybe not a good thing. The ignoring thing can be more like focusing on the opposites. So focusing on the spaces between the voices or focusing on like any amount of contentment or peace or even just like one breath, you know, just anything that's just simple and contented. Sometimes it's so subtle, we're not used to that and we just go for the bits that are like prominent and strong. But I think learning to tune up to like the simple pleasures and yeah, just being here, sitting here in a room with nice people and it's just quiet and there's a pleasure in that, you know. And that also starts to, in a way, create a sort of contentment which then lowers our expectations and our need to strive so hard. Because a lot of the inner critic comes from having really high expectations and always trying to achieve them when they're completely unrealistic. I guess we've done it for a long time. Yeah. It's, it's Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's hard. Yeah. I was thinking this on the way. I was thinking in a society which is basically formed around creating inner critics, like from the time we go, well, from the time <laughs> we can talk, I suppose. Um, is it really possible to ever overcome it? And is that even the practice? Yeah, probably. Probably, yeah. Because you get sort of signs about whether you should have grabbed that rattle or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I think, yes, it's good to become aware of these things, but to think that you've got to completely recondition yourself to be awakened is not the point. It's not about being something different. It's more about making peace and realizing that we're conditioned and not needing to fix ourselves, you know. That's good enough, it's, I think. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, who's... Per- I don't know if I've... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people actually get a little bit annoyed or disappointed in some spiritual teachers too because they don't look perfect. People want that idea of perfection, but it actually isn't there. <laughs> I don't think it really exists. It's such a relief, isn't it, when you're here? I still don't really, I still think that, you know, I should be a bit better. But it's starting to be undermined, definitely. That, that idea is starting to be undermined. It's really a relief when you think, oh, maybe this is it, this is okay. It's just to not take it as me, you know. That's the thing, just to see that it's conditioned. It's a conditioned process. That's, that's yeah. 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 Yeah, and they're all different. Exactly. Depending on the seed, the soil, the sun, and they're all okay. <laughs> yeah. And just to think what you're saying about conditioning. Yeah. Um, I was struck when you were talking about having been serving in the communities in India. We came from all over from what it's called, or uh, yeah. or whatever. But everyone ultimately in that 10 day period experienced a similar kind of up and down in terms of their emotional journey. So, would you say that conditioning is inherent and it's not cultural anywhere? It's not that we live on the side of an island that we all have to sit in a critic, it's not mm. the weather or anything like that. It's actually something more essential. Yeah, I think we probably do all have like certain degrees of various voices, but the, the sort of um, predominance might differ from culture to culture, maybe. I mean, there might be more perfectionists here, there might be more underminers somewhere else, there might be more, like, tax, tax, task masters in the office or in positions where people strive a lot, they might be more inclined that way. There might be some differences, but I think um, within all of us we have many, and um, one is more predominant sometimes than others. I mean, in these retreats, there were so many different people, like you say, and yet um, there was a sort of range. I mean, as far as I know, how do I really know what people were going through? But it seemed to me there was only a certain range of human emotion possible. Um, and the other interesting thing was that even when everybody was very different, the group energy and the retreat would seem to bring out certain things at, at 
different retreats. I don't know, maybe you've experienced that, Jenny, because you've led a lot of retreats. Mm -hmm. Like in some, everyone would come out and say, oh, that was a really peaceful retreat. Everybody seems sort of calm on this retreat. And then on others, it's like, I had a lot of anger. Oh, really? Me me too. I had a lot of anger coming up. And you find that people have been through similar things in the same retreat, which I find really interesting too, because I think we resonate with each other and it tends to bring things out. that's where the um, importance of spiritual friendship comes in, you know, sort of choosing our companionship wisely, choosing our teachers wisely, family members, you know, because we are very much influenced by each other. I guess that's why I often default to saying Westerners and then I say all people brought up in Western sort of, or capitalistic cultures. Because in the older cultures, like Nepal, no, Tibet and Burma, I think, they didn't really have a concept of guilt, which is amazing. Or self-hatred. I remember the Dalai Lama saying something about, what, why would people do that to themselves? Like, you mean they don't like themselves? And I think that's why in the Buddhist text it starts, you know, you start with metta to yourself because for them that was obvious. I mean, I still think we do put ourselves first. I mean, if you really think about it, we we are actually very self-interested. We do want ourselves to be well and safe. But sometimes it's a bit of a conflicted relationship we have. And uh, But these are mostly voices I think we've inherited. They're not very natural. Anyway, oh yeah, okay, one more. <laughs> yeah. noticing that there could be something wholesome underneath it could help us to develop compassion to the inner critic too because it's not just that we're using compassion to overcome the inner critic it's also about embracing the inner critic as part of ourselves. I mean not a fixed part but you know the parts that are like self-demeaning, self-critical that's also, that also needs compassion you know we need to learn to embrace that so yeah I think by seeing that, oh, this thing's trying to protect me, actually. It's just sort of forgotten how to say it in a nice way. <laughs> well, it hasn't learned how to say it in a nice way. Um, could soften our mind towards it, yeah, and open us up to learn something. Yeah, that's part of the investigation. Yeah, thanks. Good. So it's half past, so shall we just finish with a couple of moments of quiet meditation and just inviting you to appreciate your good qualities and beautiful intentions in coming to the group this evening and perhaps recollecting maybe one or two qualities in yourself that you really appreciate.
just ending with a few thoughts of compassion. May we all learn to meet our suffering, our pain with kindness. May we be free from suffering. May we be able to experience the highest happiness of Nibbana. <laughs>